Hello guys, I am Vinayak Rengen. Uh, I am a general laparoscopic surgeon and I also uh, run a startup called Curium Life uh, where we solve everyday problems in surgery using uh, machine learning, artificial intelligence and you know deep learning. Uh, so what I essentially do is I operate on the abdomen, I operate on uh, the thyroid breast uh, but a majority of my work deals with laparoscopy. So uh, many people call me a laparoscopic surgeon, in some countries I am called as an endoscopic surgeon. So we are going to you know, kind of look into all these terms, what is endoscopy, what is laparoscopy and we are kind of going to understand where this field stands with regards to uh, image processing, um, machine learning, deep learning and everything. So endoscopy is a very misunderstood term, you know there has been a lot of hype, a lot of you know misconceptions regarding endoscopy, uh, people imagine a, a, a scary looking surgeon with you know sharp instruments poking holes into wherever you know uh, sharp stuffs are not supposed to go but it is not as scary, it is uh, one of the most commonly done procedures all over the world and uh, the definition of endoscopy is basically using long tubes to view any hollow organ. That hollow organ can be your esophagus, stomach, your, your small intestine, large intestine, it can be uh, your bronchus, bronchus or is the you know uh, the bifurcation of the windpipe, uh, it can be you know in, in, even visualizing inside the abdomen what we call as a peritoneal cavity. So there are a lot of terms involved in this, uh, a brief understanding of these terms would uh, help you understand uh, the entire industry and you know give you an overall outlook. So what we see here is a bronchoscopy, bronchoscopy essentially involves you know passing a tube uh, through your passing a tube through your windpipe. So this bifurcates into what we call as the bronchus and you know you are able to visualize the inside of your windpipe. So this is a very important modality in, in you know diagnosing and even uh, ruling out uh, problems such as lung cancer, early lung cancer and also you know uh, kind of removing foreign bodies. So uh, again like any forms of endoscopy it can be either diagnostic or therapeutic. When I say diagnostic it means like you are trying to diagnose or find out what the problem is. When I say therapeutic I mean I am trying to treat what the problem is. So bronchoscopy can also be uh, diagnostic or therapeutic. So when I diagnose I can I can you know just visualize what is there, is there a problem, I can take biopsies, uh, these biopsies will be sent to the pathologist and they will tell me whether it is cancer or whether it is something to be scared or not scared, it can be therapeutic, when I say therapeutic I can remove foreign bodies, I can remove small growths or polyps. So what you see here is a image of a lesion at the bifurcation, near the bifurcation. So here you can see that the uh, trachea, uh, the windpipe is bifurcating into the uh, right bronchi and the left bronchi. So uh, here you see a lesion, it could be a suspicious lesion, it could be cancer So uh, or it could be uh, something which we do not know and you know what we are kind of trying to do is we might take a biopsy from there and send it to the pathologist to understand what that is. Upper GI endoscopy, upper GI endoscopy is what we traditionally understand or call as endoscopy. When I say endoscopy what I usually mean is just upper GI endoscopy, that involves you know putting a tube into your foot pipe and it goes into the stomach where I can visualize the stomach and sometimes even early part of the small intestine, again it can be diagnostic or therapeutic. Uh, when I say diagnostic you know you can see if there is a cancer. And when I say therapeutic again I can remove foreign bodies, if there is in fact uh, it is kind of advanced so much that if there is a, a, a small tear or a perforation was what we call you know you can even close those rents through endoscopy. So endoscopy as a field has advanced extremely well and now we are you know even able to go into the biliary tract which is like the bile duct and the pancreas to remove stones. So that is all very technical stuff uh, um, inside endoscopy and that is not something what you are going to do. Here what you see is an image is a computer vision tool as you know kind of segmented lesions in an endoscopy. So uh, endoscopy because of the huge volumes it has, has immense uh, applications in the area of machine learning and you know uh, supervised and unsupervised learning as well. So here what you can see is uh, somebody has boxed the lesion in both these lesions and you know you can use machine learning tools to kind of understand what these stuff are. Lower GI endoscopy is traditionally called as colonoscopy, it involves passing a tube through your anus and visualizing the large intestine, the large intestine you know leads into this thing, the anus 
and it involves passing a tube through here and it goes till where the small intestine starts. So, uh, it is a very technically demanding procedure much more demanding than uh, the tr traditional upper GI endoscopy. Again it can be diagnostic or therapeutic, a diagnostic and colonoscopies are performed on a day to day basis, thousands of them are performed every day in India and you know uh, uh, all over the world it is a, a very common procedure. In most parts of the world it is a daycare procedure, it can be therapeutic you know you can remove small polyps, uh, you can uh, 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 do certain small procedures over there through colonoscopy as well. Laparoscopy, laparoscopy is essentially putting a tube inside the abdomen uh, that is me on the screen. So, what I am trying to do is I am trying to remove the gallbladder, gallbladder is an organ just under the liver and right now since early 90s laparoscopy has been considered the gold standard for uh, gallbladder surgeries. In many other fields of surgery laparoscopy is slowly emerging as a gold standard, these days we perform a whole gamut of procedures through laparoscopy. As you can see here in this particular diagram, uh, this is the abdomen and you know you inflate the abdomen with gas which is usually carbon dioxide and put in a camera this is usually a 10 mm 10 mm or a 5 mm camera and then you have working ports 2, 3, 4 depending on uh, um, how you use them and these can involve graspers, uh, needle holders, you can suture, you can cut stuff, you can remove stuff. Uh, there are a whole host of videos available on YouTube or any other platform so you can kind of, kind of watch them to understand what really happens in laparoscopy. Uh, there is a lot of physics and optics involved in laparoscopy. Uh, we have different types of cameras, there, there are 0 degree cameras, then we have 30 degree cameras you know which kind of allow for greater degree of movement. There are 45 degree cameras, each of them has their own different applications. There are energy devices which you can push through your laparoscopy, there can be uh, uh, electrocautery and it is a whole uh, different a field of physics you know surgical electrocautery and surgical energy devices and uh, uh, these days we are you know using laparoscopic ultrasound as well you know putting an ultrasound device through your laparoscope and you know trying to visualize uh, certain cancers which cannot be visualized through CT or MRI or you know traditional ultrasound. So, the, the potential for laparoscopy is immense and right now we are doing everything through laparoscopy, a lot of stuff through laparoscopy, it requires a huge amount of uh, skill and dedication on the part of the uh, learner and who to you know improve his skills in laparoscopy. And uh, uh, so, some of the basic principles of laparoscopy is that there is obviously, so this is the abdomen. So, I am just going to take the example of a gallbladder, so here is your gallbladder. So, uh, while approaching an organ what you essentially follow is the principle of triangulation. So, if this is the gallbladder and you need to approach it your camera should be angled in this manner in the center and your working instrument should be like this. So, this is essentially called as the baseball diamond configuration where you kind of approach the target organ like a baseball diamond. The instruments are here and the camera port is through here. So, uh, I would not I am not going to you know delve too much into the principles of laparoscopy, but the major need for under you know um, the challenge in laparoscopy is that you are not touching the organ with your hands. So, you lose that tactile sensation and you know for 200 years, 300 years we have been taught that surgery is a very tactile art you know you feel the organ, you touch the organ and that is something we which we kind of lose with laparoscopy. But what advantage it gives is that it provides a degree of magnification which is not possible uh, with conventional open surgery. So, there are certain advantages, there are certain disadvantages and uh, Robotic surgery is a type of laparoscopy, in fact uh, what we call as laparoscopy is straight stick laparoscopy. So, your instruments are like this and robotic surgery is not you know artificial intelligence surgery, uh, there is no robo you know operating independently and trying to uh, you know solve problems that is still not allowed anywhere in part of any in any part of the world and I am sure you would also not want uh, a non-human you know trying to take decisions inside your abdomen as of now, I mean at least I would not. Uh, even though I understand a little bit of AI and surgery as well, I still am not confident enough to trust a machine. So, robotic surgery is essentially a kind of laparoscopy where the principles are same as laparoscopy except that e the instrument at the end has a wrist like motion. So, what we call as the degrees of freedom. So, the traditional robo, the most commonly used robo is what we call as a Da Vinci robo produced by Intuitive Surgicals and it has 7 degrees of freedom which allows you to you know kind of uh, uh, manipulate organs, it gives you a semi tactile feel you know and with recent advances in machine learning and uh, artificial intelligence, the amount of haptic feedback those instruments are giving is also kind of improving. So, you know uh, technology is moving in the way to you know take minimal access surgery. Uh, uh, 
I, I personally feel that minimal access surgery itself is a misnomer because uh, it is actually maximal access. The entry is small, but your access you get is quite maximal. So, it is taking uh, laparoscopic surgery towards you know newer frontiers. We are able to you know come as close to open surgery as possible along with the advantages of uh, um, open surgery such as tactile sensation. So, a lot of effort is devoted into understanding uh, the uh, structure of organs, uh, are we touching the right organ, are we cutting the right organ. So, uh, that is an area of research in which uh, my team is also closely involved with IIT Madras in trying to you know uh, uh, implement scoring systems in laparoscopy and in endoscopy where we you know try to assess surgical performance, we try to assess whether the surgeon has you know correctly executed a set of steps which lead into safer surgery. So, uh, the ultimate beneficiary in all these experiments is the patient because uh, laparoscopy has changed the way surgery is being performed all over the world. We do have patients going back home or going back to work. My own father was operated uh, using laparoscopy and he was back to work in about 2 to 3 days and, and that would be something unimaginable 20 years ago where we were using conventional surgery and if you had the conventional surgery, I, it, it's, uh, you would be out of work for at least 20 days, 15, 20 days. So, the perceptions of laparoscopy and endoscopy are changing throughout the world, especially in the field of intervention. There was a time when laparoscopy was considered a surgery for the rich, you know, advanced devices and the thing. But the fact is that laparoscopy has the potential um, and the need not just in the well-off population, it serves the poorest of the poor because a rich man can afford to stay out of work for 15 days. A poor man, a daily labourer cannot you know afford to stay out of work for even if the state, even if the government is providing surgeries free of cost which is uh, the case in India. We have a, a, a public health care system which is pretty good. We are performing all these surgeries in the public health care system. I was trained in a public health care system and all these surgeries are being performed. The biggest beneficiary is the poor people because they are able to return back to work faster and I think uh, that is pushing this field further. So, why do I need to know about all this? Uh, most of you guys are engineers you know who are trying to get into medical imaging, medical image processing and uh, understanding medical data. So, uh, for the past 10 to 15 years as AI has grown, CT and MRI have been the foundation of artificial intelligence. You know we have had tangible images, we have been able to extract ground truth uh, easily in CTs and uh, MRIs because you are able to label the data, uh, the data is more reliable the data is less operator dependent unlike endoscopy or laparoscopy because there is a lot of operator dependence. The way I handle the camera is going to be very different from the way my other surgeon handles it. The way I place the instruments is going to be very different. I have might have my own personal preferences, but that is not the case in CT or MRI where the uh, uh, the machine you know takes a scan and the only the interpretation is left to the radiologist and that is where AI has played a major role. But over the last few years endoscopy and laparoscopy has you know a kind of uh, the amount of cases has exponentially increased as more surgeons are having access to laparoscopy and endoscopy. Uh, the previous generation of surgeons about 10 years older than me they never trained in laparoscopy. But uh, when I was training at Madras Medical College you know laparoscopy had become pretty standard and when my juniors are being trained right now they have more access to laparoscopy because the costs are decreasing as well. And but there have been very few advances in the area of endoscopic imaging and uh, you know uh, machine learning and uh, uh, deep learning uh, because these are new fields. So, if you look at most of the papers, most of these papers are from 2017-18 and uh, since the COVID 2020 to 22, we have seen an explosion of uh, you know research in this particular field. But it is still a very nascent field and there are a lot of work to be done. So, here you can see a lot of papers. Uh, so, most of these papers are in 2020 or uh, 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 so, uh, so a lot of papers are coming up, these are all clinical journals, these are not technical journals uh, uh, which are talk about machine learning in GI endoscopy, GI is gastrointestinal endoscopy and uh, how uh, endoscopists are using um, uh, machine learning and deep learning to understand these concepts. One of the major challenges which has been in adoption is that clinicians are have not you know kind of warmed up to the idea of using artificial intelligence for diagnosis. There is still a lot of resistance among the clinicians to using artificial intelligence techniques. There is a lot of there is a huge perception that uh, how can a machine understand um, 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 a diagnosis or a cancer or a particular polyp better than a human and uh, evidence has been conclusively mounting that uh, machine learning techniques 
how are you know kind of improving and are proving to be better than uh, clinicians in understanding endoscopy uh, and endos making endoscopic diagnosis. So, computer vision in endoscopy it can be computer aided detection which is for lesion detection which we call as CAD E or computer aided diagnosis which is can be called as CAD X for optical biopsy and lesion characterization. There are other you know roles of uh, computer vision in endoscopy such as guidance systems like for example, if you are finding difficult to negotiate the scope through narrow spaces AI can kind of help in understanding that. Uh, so, we are going to discuss a clinical problem. So, we are going to discuss a problem called Barrett's esophagus or intestinal metaplasia also called as high grade dysplasia. It is basically uh, what you have to kind of understand here is that this is the esophagus and it kind of leads into the stomach. So, the insides of these tubes are lined by cells which are called as epithelium. These can be these can be multilayered depending on which part of the intestine or uh, organ we are talking about. So, in patients who have a huge amount of acidity or gastroesophageal reflex disease GERD gastroesophageal reflex disease, what kind of happens is that the acid which is being produced in the stomach and early part of the small intestine kind of refluxes back into the esophagus. There is usually a mechanism which prevents that there are valves there is a sphincter which kind of you know there is a muscle basically which kind of contracts when the esophagus uh, when it is in resting state which prevents this reflux from happening. So, but when these muscles or the sphincter gets sort of relaxed due to multiple reasons whether it can be due to an excess pro production of acid it can be uh, uh, due to a whole host of factors including genetic factors this acid can reflux back and you know kind of damage the epithelium over here. So, what happens is that the epithelium of the lower esophagus starts resembling the epithelium of the stomach. So, this is called as intestinal metaplasia. So, this can you know predispose to cancer. So, this intestinal metaplasia is called as Barrett's esophagus in short called as BE this BE can progress into cancer. The type of cancer variety of cancer is way beyond the scope of this particular discussion. So, how do you know whether it is Barrett's esophagus or whether it is cancer? You look at this particular image, how do I know which part of the intestine could be cancer? So, the cancer could be over here, it could be it, it grows as a small thing, it could be over here, it could be over here, it could be over here, it could be over here. Honestly looking at this particular image, I am not able to find out where this particular uh, 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 Barrett's esophagus could have cancer and you know to understand that they have some devised something called as a Seattle protocol. Seattle protocol consists of 4 quadrant jumbo biopsies every 1 centimeter uh, uh, with biopsies of mucosal abnormality. So, for example, if you you know kind of see this, this is the Barrett's esophagus area, this entire demarcated area you know where the color change. So, this kind if you look at it under the microscope, it kind of resembles uh, how the stomach would be uh, inside and this is the lower esophageal you know the muscles contracting which prevent the reflux, but there is this muscle complex has kind of gotten loose and you know it is allowing the acid to come into the esophagus. Uh, I think everybody would have you know kind of felt that you know you have had that heartburn after you have had a whole plate of biryani at 1 am uh, along with uh, uh, some beer or coke. I think that is what you know if it happens on a regular basis and you kind of tune your diet to that particular modality uh, it is bound to happen and that is not very healthy by the way yeah. So, uh, what the Seattle protocol kind of does is that it goes every 1 centimeter distance and takes biopsies in every 4 quadrants here, 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 here and then another 1 centimeter here, 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 here. So, this is the Seattle protocol and that has been followed for multiple years because we never have a way of determining where the cancer could be. But you look at these studies, this is as early as 2008 and 2009, Seattle protocol does not reliably predict the detection of cancer at the time of esophagectomy than a less intensive surveillance protocol. I mean then there is this I mean a 2009 paper which is even more you know uh, uh, kind of uh, uh, striking on the face, declaration of bankruptcy for 4 quadrant biopsies in Barrett's esophagus. So, is it really obsolete 
not yet because we kind of not have you know started using uh, uh, machine learning and deep learning in a, in a in a big extent big way so here's this paper this is a 2017 paper computer aided detection of early barrett's uh, neoplasia using volumetric laser endoscopy this was published in a top journal in our field gastroenterology endoscopy so what we here use here is a a type of endoscopy called as volumetric endomicroscopy which is a kind of microscopy which is performed through the endoscope where you get an advanced imaging which provides near microscopic resolution of the abdominal wall layers uh, sorry the esophageal wall layers so esophagus is divided into multiple layers what you see over here on the what you would see on the uh, endoscopy would be the mucosa there are there is something called as a submucosa there are multiple lymphatics lymph channels there are muscle coats muscle layers which are kind of the thing understanding this anatomy is very essential and if you look at this uh, it kind of under makes you understand what are the layers of the this thing so here is the uh, the layer closest so you go these are layers which are deeper and here what you can see is the muscle layer so basically it provides a extremely high resolution of what you see in an endoscopy so one of the changes in uh, malignancy would be the loss of layering and higher surface than subsurface signal uh, intensity if you look at this particular image this is uh, the uh, uh, what you ndbe is non dysplastic barrett esophagus when i say non dysplastic barrett esophagus it means that barrett esophagus which is not kind of become cancer and eac is esophageal adenocarcinoma which is uh, the uh, doctor speak for saying uh, esophageal cancer uh, and adenocarcinoma is a type of cancer there are multiple types of cancers by the way uh, just saying adenocarcinoma does not you know kind of uh, correlate to all types of cancer and uh, so if you look at this particular image you will see that uh, the uh, vle images show that the esophagus is arranged in layers there's a layer over here there's a layer over here there's a layer here uh, there's a layer here 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 so these are multiple layers which you can see if you look at this particular image the layering is not very clearly visible this layering is not very clearly visible and if you look at the intensity on the surface this is the surface this is the surface and this is the subsurface the difference is there but if you look over here in this particular image the difference in signal intensity is pretty significant the in image b it is much more darker the signals are higher in uh, on the surface uh, the difference is um, is remarkably visible so uh, in this particular image again we can see the same uh, uh, see the same thing there's a lack of layering over here and the signal intensity on the surface is higher oh yeah so basically using image processing techniques uh, what we kind of, what they did in this particular study is they uh, analyzed those features and extracted data of these particular features which is the presence or absence of layering and the difference in signal intensities between surface and subsurface i will not be getting into the technical details the papers are available and then they uh, uh, you know use that uh, into and fed that uh, information into a machine learning model so the training images were pre processed to remove uh, low quality images and then you know the features were extracted so they took these two features which is the uh, signal difference uh, the signal intensity difference and um, the presence or absence of layering and they they fed it into a model uh, there was classification again uh, you know using all these models they were able to uh, predict the presence of cancers and that uh, accuracy is you know compared to the gold standard which is uh, uh, a surgeon uh, measuring uh, the uh, the um, images or extracting those features as well as the actual gold standard is the biopsy specimens where you are able to confirm whether there is actual cancer or not so these were the machine learning models used so the most see the uh, successful models are highlighted in gray so svm support vector machine and adaboost kind of proved to be uh, very effective and uh, when they used they tested using just layering and signal intensity distribution but when they found that you know they were able to combine both layering and signal decay statistics the uh, auc was pretty high and uh, in adaboost and support vector machine so uh, this is the area under the curve so experts demonstrated an area under the curve of 0.81 and when you are using uh, both layering and signal decay the area under the curve was 0.95 which proved that the experts were kind of significantly less effective than the machine learning models 
So, the results when the sensitivity of optimal features which is layering and signal decay statistics was 90 percent and the specificity was 93 percent uh, and when you are using layering and signal intensity distribution it showed a specific sensitivity and specificity of 83 and 93 and 83 and 87 percent respectively. So, there are a huge number of advantages. So, what we saw was just one of the examples of how you can use uh, artificial intelligence and DLML in understanding uh, and helping early diagnosis. The benefits are pretty high. If you detect an esophageal adenocarcinoma earlier on, you are able to perform a surgery. You are able to avoid sometimes uh, life threatening palliative chemotherapy. You are able to remove only that lesion and kind of escape doing an esophagectomy. An esophagectomy is a very difficult, very technically demanding and a very morbid, morbid procedure where you remove a significant part of the esophagus and sometimes the entire esophagus. Create a new esophagus using your stomach or the colon, 6, 7, sometimes even 10 hour surgeries uh, 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 with very uh, 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 poor outcomes in certain cases. Of course, with advances in surgery, many of these surgeries are also being you know performed safely, but once the cancer kind of infiltrates into the layers. So, as the staging of the cancers is you know kind of done in layers. So, if you can see this is the lumen, this is what you is your foot pipe and these are the layers and uh, uh, as the cancer you know kind of infiltrates deeper into the layers, the prognosis becomes poor and poor because as it grows deeper it kind of spreads into the lymphatics, it spreads into other parts of the body as well. The cancers can tend to metastasize. So, it is extremely essential that we kind of arrive at an early diagnosis. Much of the research in endoscopy has been done in Japan which has a very effective screening program for early gastric cancer. So, uh, the tradition in Japan is that on the 30th birthday everybody gets an endoscopy done uh, uh, for diagnosis. So, much of the research has been performed in Japan for especially gastric cancer uh, what we call as the EGC early gastric cancer and uh, there is uh, computers to diagnosis for early cancer. Uh, early gastric cancer diagnosis. If you have an early gastric cancer diagnosis, you can actually treat it by endoscopic mucosal resection, where you kind of go through endoscopy itself and can you remove the cancer and come out. You know how nice that is, you know having a, a very deadly disease like gastric cancer and you know you go in the morning, oh I have gastric cancer, the surgeon kind of identifies the gastric cancer, takes a biopsy, confirms it, 3-4 days later you go in same endoscopy, you go in the morning, come back in the evening, your cancer is cured and that is so beautiful. Imagine if the patient comes back 3 or 4 months down the line, he has to undergo what we call as a gastrectomy, where we remove a part of the stomach, we remove a part of the small intestine as well, because the cancer usually spreads along over there. You have to remove a whole host of lymphatics in the abdomen, the surgery operating time for the D2 gastrectomy is usually at least 4 to 6 hours. Uh, it can be done laparoscopically again, but the challenges still are there. Survival rates are still hovering between uh, 60 to 90 percent depending on the center and in you know imagine in centers where there is a 60 percent survival rate, it essentially means that you know you delay the diagnosis by 3 months and 40 out of 100 people are you know going to succumb to the diagnosis. The gastric cancer would have kind of spread, many times we go into the abdomen, we find that the cancer has spread to the liver it has spread to other parts of the intestine, you know it has spread inside the abdomen completely and then we tell the patient and the attender, it is a very difficult scenario, uh, because you not, you may not make it uh, your, your mother or father or your sometimes very sadly you have to tell the parents that their son is going to die of cancer within the next few months and, and I think that that is completely avoidable. Early diagnosis in this particular era is possible and it becomes kind of inexcusable if we miss diagnosis and that is where the role of uh, engineers, machine learning experts kind of comes into play. Uh, it can be used for you know cancer staging and estimation of uh, invasion depth. Many times you can you put an endoscopy you see the cancer over there, but you do not know how inside it has gone. So, you have a cancer over here you do not know how much inside it has gone into the surface. So, this helps us in staging the disease. So, if it has kind of reached over there you can say that it has become a T4 lesion or sometimes a stage 4 lesion and the patient may have a poor survival. So, the entire survival of the patient depends on where the cancer is. If the cancer is over here, it is good. If the cancer is over here, it is it's slightly bad. If it is over here, even more bad. And if it goes over here, it becomes really bad. And it is just a matter of few millimeters. And the role of uh, early diagnosis kind of plays a role. And even if 
uh, we are not able to make an early diagnosis, understanding the depth of penetration helps us in having a meaningful discussion with the patients about their survival and that is very important in this particular era. In the lower GI area, we can use uh, the, um, uh, uh, computer aided detection for uh, polyp detection and identification. We can use it for the polyp characterization and classification, and you know you can you know use it for predicting uh, mucosal inflammatory activity in inflammatory bowel disease. Inflammatory bowel disease you might have heard of it, Crohn's disease and uh, ulcerative colitis. These are all not cancers. These can lead to cancers in certain cases, but these are all very potentially painful condition that you know affects a patient's life for. 15, 20 years, they reduce the quality of life. I know of many doctors who kind of suffer from these lesions. Uh, we can use them for mucosal inflammatory activity prediction and uh, that mucosal inflammatory activity, understanding that helps us in understanding what medications to give. Some of the medications we give for ulcerative colitis and Crohn's disease also have a huge amount of side effects. So, they we give a lot of steroids to treat them. So, understanding the exact level of inflammatory activity helps us in tapering and adjusting the dose so that we can free the patients of the side effects of these drugs. The future endoscopy as we know is changing rapidly. There is growing acceptance of the efficiency and reliability of uh, artificial intelligence in GI endoscopy and I sincerely believe that AI is the future in endoscopy and laparoscopy. Uh, in the next session, we will be discussing more about laparoscopy in detail and how we are able to use laparoscopy to make patients lives safer and better. Thank you. Here are the references for the presentation. Thank you so much.